our last lecture, we considered the multiparticle situation of a head-on collision. In that case, all the action happened in one spatial dimension. Collisions in the real world are frequently not head-on, which means the motion before and after the collision happens in more than one spatial dimension. We'll do an example of a glancing collision and we'll see that we already know all the physics we need to understand this problem. It's the same physics as in the head-on case. Namely, we have strong interactions between the objects during a relatively brief time interval. So once again, the multiparticle form of Newton's second law, or equivalently, the multiparticle momentum principle, provides a very good starting point to make progress on understanding what's going on. In particular, by choosing the system to contain all the colliding particles, then once again, in effect, before, during, and after the collision, the net interactions with the surroundings, expressed as F net, are in essence zero. So once again, Newton's second law will tell us the system's momentum is conserved. The big difference here for a glancing collision is that we'll need to apply the idea of momentum conservation along every spatial direction where momentum vectors have non-zero components. So the general application of the principle is the same. We just need to do a bit more math to work this out in more than one spatial dimension. Let's try this example. Object 1 has mass m1 and initial momentum p1 initial as shown just before it strikes object 2, which has mass m2 as shown. Just before the collision, object 2 has an initial momentum p2 initial as shown. After the collision, object 1 is observed to have a final momentum p1 final as shown. Questions. What is the momentum of object 2 after the collision? And is the collision elastic or inelastic? This problem should look very familiar. It's nearly identical to the head-on collision problems we solved earlier, except the momenta here are vectors with more than one non-zero component. No matter, our fundamental principle, Newton's second law, applied to the system of both objects tells us that the system momentum vector P1 plus P2 is constant in time. Momentum is conserved. So it must be true that the initial system momentum, the system momentum before the collision, is equal to the final system momentum, the system momentum after the collision. So let's write that out. Now we see we know everything here except for the final momentum of object 2, P2F. So let's solve for that and plug in the numerical values, and we obtain the final momentum of object 2, which is what we want to define. Notice here that since we have two spatial directions where there are non-zero components of momentum, then the statement that the system momentum vector is constant in time means that the component of momentum along each coordinate direction must be constant in time. In a Cartesian coordinate system, this means each coordinate direction is an independent expression of this. For example, the statement that the x component of the system momentum, the sum of the x components of the object's momenta, is constant, is a separate statement independent from the statement that saying the y component of the system's momentum, the sum of the y components of the object's momenta, is constant. So bottom line, for each spatial dimension where we can apply momentum conservation, we obtain a condition to allow us to solve for an unknown. In this case, a collision in two dimensions, momentum conservation allows us to solve for two unknowns, the x and y components of object 2's final momentum. Now let's check to see whether the collision is elastic or inelastic. We know how to do this. Let's compute the kinetic energy of the system, the sum of the object's kinetic energies before the collision, and compare that to the system kinetic energy after the collision. Here we compute these energies directly from the magnitudes of the momenta. We need to be careful to find the momentum magnitudes properly, as usual, when we need to find the magnitude of a vector with multiple non-zero components. Once these energies are in hand, we can compute the change in kinetic energy, delta k, and we find the kinetic energy change is non-zero and negative. So the collision is inelastic, which means the loss of kinetic energy shows up as a gain in the system's internal energy. 
Where that energy gain occurs depends on the specifics of the system. If we assume that the gain shows up as thermal energy, then our energy principle for this would be like this. And from this, we can find that the increase in thermal energy is as shown. So as a result, we would expect the temperature of one or more of the objects that collide in this case would be higher after the collision than before.